We're going to get right into it. Say, we're going to get right into it. Uh, because I believe that if you're here today, this word is for you. So I just want you to be selfish for a minute. And uh, I want you to real, uh, I, want, I need your attention. And, and I need for you to hear what God wants you to hear today. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse number 1. We have been in Nehemiah for now about six or seven weeks. And uh, it's so much in Nehemiah. I beseech you now, brothers and sisters, to read Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse number 1. Now, when Sabalat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates, Sabalat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come and let us meet together at Hecapharam in the plain of, oh no, but they intended to do me harm. I want you to meet us in the plain of, oh no. But Nehemiah realized that they intended to do him harm. So uh, if, if this is your first time hearing this message, Sambalat literally means a secret enemy. Tobiah means God is good. And Geshem means when it rains. So you got Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem, and you put that all together, you have a secret enemy that uses religion and makes it rain and causes floods all throughout your life. And so when the enemies of God uh, become, uh, uh, when the enemies of God recognize your progress in God, they are upset. Do not count it strange when you make your mind up to do right that there is predictable resistance to you trying to do right. But the problem is that the saints of God are not getting stronger, we're getting weaker. Amen. And so you and I are prepared for the onslaught, but we don't use the tools that can only come from God. Come and so Think it not strange when trouble comes. A man born of a woman is a few days and full of. And so if you are in the midst of trouble, I have to applaud you because trouble is a, is, is a sign that God has not forgotten you. Oh, you think about it. In the midst of trouble, it's when God shows out. Because we exhaust our own resources and finally something clicks in us that if God don't help me, I can't be helped. <laughs> Trouble is a blessing for the believer. I know, I know this has been a hard week. But you're in the right place right now. Uh, because before you go to the plane of oh no... You need to understand uh, that God has created himself to be for us all that we need. Verse number four, I mean, verse number two. So the first thing he does is uh, the enemy tactics is uh, to put around you deceiving friends. You better watch your friends. See, the problem is that we recognize the enemy, but it's the people closest to us that can cause us more pain. I'm just going to preach to myself. Uh, see, the enemy made a friendly invite, but Proverbs 16 and 28 says, A dishonest man spreads strife, strife and a whisperer separates close friends. Sometimes it's the people that whisper to you that separate you from your God-given purpose. I have noticed that, peop that, that the people who mean to do me well and benefit me, they never whisper. They call out names. Isn't it interesting that, that the people who call you strife always say, some people, everybody says, everybody? The plane of, oh no. Oh no in the Hebrew means strengthen. So this is what I want you to do. Uh, there are people who are friendly to your face but playing your downfall behind your back. Be careful of your deceiving friends. Because this, this is the biggest one. Time doesn't make anyone loyal. 
it's the option to be disloyal that does. Listen, I'm not faithful to my wife because I don't have any options. I'm faithful when there's an option and I remain faithful. Commitment is never based on convenience. Don't be my friend publicly and talk about me privately. Deceiving friends. And so what happens is we run the gamut of trying to call everybody friends. And Tiffany, they not. So my grandma used to say it this way. Uh, handle that one with the long handle spoon. Uh, you don't discount them or, 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 or cut them off. But once they reveal themselves to you, believe it in the prophet of Medea. But, but here's the thing. <laughs> to, uh, to combat deception, you must have discernment. Man, discernment helps us distinguish from good from evil. And so some, th some things are, appear to be good, but they're bad. i give you an example. Uh, I can testify to this. Uh, no matter how, much, uh, how many times I eat cake, uh, it's not good for me. It tastes good. And so now me and Tanya are doing this thing, and all I'm doing now is eating nuts. And I just want to say, it doesn't taste like cake. <laughs> and so oftentimes, just because it's good to you doesn't mean it's good for you. And so there are things you got to be careful about the flattering lips of the people around you. Tell me the truth. Yeah. But I've lived long enough to know, good seeing you. I lived long enough to know that everybody doesn't want you to be a blessing. What does building the walls have to do with Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem? Mind your business, but your progress provokes people. Uh -oh. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. The sermon is, is trained by the constant practice to distinguish good from evil. We have to be trained in discernment because after a while and by and by, there are going to be people that's closest to you that mean you harm, but if you can't see it, you start taking what appears to be godly advice. Appears. The more you exercise the good, the more you will be able to resist the evil. So when the enemy strikes back, pray for discernment. Discernment is the ability to judge matters according to God's view of them and not according to what you see. I have to judge everything by the word of God. Everything, Reverend? Everything. Outward appearances can be deceiving. First Samuel 16 and 7. Man looks on the outward, but the Lord looks at the heart. The heart, say the heart, is always revealed in time. I used to say, but that was from a wounded place, no new friends. Because I didn't want to deal with trying to figure out who's with me until I kept my eyes on Christ. And then what I realized was, if they're not with me, if they, they, they are with me, it shouldn't change my opinion about them because I'm focused on Christ. It's when I take my eyes off him, I'm concerned about what's around me. Ability to see good when it's bad and bad when it looks good. That's discernment. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse number 3. I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent messages to me four times in this manner. And I answered them in the same way. They kept asking me to come meet them in the place of, oh, no. I did this four times. A couple things. Access is a gift. Protect it. Everyone should not have access to you and I the same. So uh, remember a few months ago we talked about uh, intimate space? Intimate space, I don't know what that is, but praise the Lord. Um, intimate space is the space that's designed versus the divine space. The divine space is just me and God. 
I tell God everything. And then there's intimate space where I share it with my wife and I share it with, free fr um, with, with friends, close friends, friends have been tried, friends who know my dirt and still love me. Intimate space. Then there's personal space. Personal space is you have some access, but you don't know everything. And then there's social space. So church is a social space. Everybody can't know everything about you in the social space. But if you don't have people in your personal space or intimate space, you are living an impaired life. So everybody can't go with you. So when people don't come with you, don't be upset. Because everybody, everybody is not designed for your intimate space. Understand what I'm talking about? Don't waste time with distractions because here's the reality. Sometimes, say sometimes, the enemy is more persistent than we are consistent. And so when the enemy comes in like a flood, uh, the challenge of the church, of the people of God, we are so inconsistent, it's the, and not even a hurricane that affects us. The, it's the three, it's the three pigs and it's the great big bad wolf. He's just huffing and puffing. He's not doing anything, but because I'm so inconsistent, the huffing and puffing scares me. Amen. The enemy is more persistent than we are consistent. So verse number five, in the same way, say in the same way, this dude comes for the fifth time. He sends his servant with an open letter. In his hand, it was written, it is reported among the nations. And Geshem also says it. See, watch, listen to this. The other nations are saying this. And Geshem is also saying this. That the reason that you and the Jews uh, tend to rebel, that is why you're really doing it. You're building a wall. And according to these reports, uh, your ultimate goal is to become king. And you have also set up prophets, you, you, you got your own religion now, to proclaim you as the king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports. You know, you're close to the king. You was the king's cupbearer. So he's going to hear this, and he's going to respond. And so you in trouble. We found you out. So now come and let us counsel together. Let's all work this out. And then I sent to him saying, no such things as you have said, you say have been done. For you are inventing them in your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking that their hands would drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. So the second, uh, the second uh, tactic of the enemy, the first is to surround you with deceiving friends. The second is deploy fear. Fear paralyzes you causes you to shrink back. But Nehemiah's response is, oh God, strengthen my hands. But here's the problem. They hit close. All this other stuff was okay, Monet. But see, what happens is the enemy hits close to you, and that is what really frightens you. You're in the king. You're trying to rebel against the king. So here's how to, to stop uh, the fear tactics of the enemy. Engage the truth and stop entertaining lies. Who cares what they say about you if you and I know the truth? Oh, man, that's so many social warrior, social media warriors that we have to declare a thing. And we have to prove our side. But if Jesus is our, is our example, uh, he never, uh, the, perfect, the person who is perfect never responded to the accusations. But here's another dose of reality. Ignoring fear doesn't produce faith. Confronting it does. Uh, many of us don't like to confront and so what we have to do is confront the lie with truth. Because the root of all confusion is a lie. A repeated lie doesn't mean it's true. But you must stand firm to the truth of God's word. And no matter how many times a lie is told, it doesn't make it true. 
uh, be careful when someone comes to you with absolutes. Everybody is saying. Some people. Well, who is everybody? And who is some people? Because unless you name names, I'm good. Some people believe that how you offended them. Well, wow, who is it? <sighs> Not liberty to say. Then why you tell it? I will believe everybody when everybody is on their birth certificate. So when somebody comes to me and says, everybody says, that must be their first name. Sometimes lies hit so close to home, and that's what a, that's what a dis discomfort is. Symbolic, the enemy knew that Nehemiah was close to the king, and he attempted to use that to spread fear. Be careful with the whispers, because whispers can produce seeds of discord. If you have areas of confusion in your life, I'm begging you to go to God's word and hear what he says about it. If you have confusion about your finances, I'm begging you to go to God's word and see what God's word says about it. If you have confusion about relationships, I'm begging you to go to God's word as the source because he eliminates confusion. So if you're living a confused life, the question you got to ask yourself, who has your ear? Man, I know it's good. Uh, because what's happening is uh, I have to go through this first. And sometimes I don't have the questions. And he gives me an answer. And then I go back and it's like, that's what. confusion is when we fail to take God at his word and live according to it. If we are confused about our future, what does God say about it? The tension is believing God, truth, versus believing a lie. Because a lifestyle of lies always leads to continuous confusion. If you built that marriage on a lie, oh, it's coming back. If you built that relationship on a lie, it's coming back. But here's our help. John chapter 8, verse number 32. Jesus says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But here's how what we quote. But here's the, 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 the whole concept of that scripture. It's found in verse number 31. If you hold to my teaching. You are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you hold to my teaching. So that implies that there's going to become a time where some of us, if we're not careful, we're not going to hold to his teaching, and that leads to confusion. Verse number 10. Shemaiah. This is crazy. His name literally means heard by Yahweh. God said, be careful with people's response when they say, God said. Especially if it doesn't agree with your spirit. Because how does God change his mind? God said, I'm supposed to be here. God didn't, God, now I leave. So if there is a conflict, it cannot come from God. The origin of our faith is built off every word that comes out of God's mouth, and this is his word. And so if we're not careful, I have to be careful. God said, no, it sounded like a good idea, Nate. Because when I say God said, what happens, I have to make it happen if he didn't say it. So uh, God said was confined to his home. That's crazy, right? He said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they're coming to kill you. Wow, they are coming to kill you by night. But I said, so what kind of man am I to run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple? And I'm not a priest. I can't go in the temple. I will not go in. So, deceiving friends. What's the second one? Deploying fear. And not necessarily the biggest, but it's the biggest. Discourage faith. 
discouraged faces when uh, you abandon what God told you to do for the comfort of the world. Don't compromise God's commandments for your comfort. I'm going to say it again. Don't compromise God's commandments for your comfort. Nehemiah knew that the only the priests were allowed to be in the temple, but the enemy tried to get him to disobey God. Your obedience to God, not compromising, uh, will reveal the hand of the enemy because there will always be opportunities for disobedience. And sometimes disobedience is rooted in your personal comfort. I'm walking towards God, and along the way, I'm losing friends. I'm walking with God, and it seems like everything is falling apart. I'm walking with God, and it seems to get harder. And the, 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 the challenge for us is to keep walking with God, recognizing it's getting harder, and it's getting harder. And because the, 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 the enemy is just throwing everything at me, my thoughts are all messed up, I got a tendency to want to fall back. I got to learn how to live in truth and reject the lie. I got to hold fast to what God said. And God will use, say any, I'm sorry, the enemy will use, say anyone, anyone. God, the enemy will use anyone to manipulate you to stop building what you know God told you to build. Ask Job. It wasn't that his wife hated him. His wife recognized that he was suffering and he was losing everything. So she said, won't you just curse God and die? And Job said, you, 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 you listen, listen, you foolish woman. What happens is some people around us see the suffering that we have to, that, that we're enduring and they just want it all to stop. But Nehemiah said, it's a good work. It ain't coming down. So the enemy will use the seemingly godly to get you to stop the work. Verse number 15, so the wall was finished. Woo, thank you, Jesus. After all of this, from Nehemiah hearing what happened uh, in Nehemiah chapter 1, praying for four months, remember that? And then having a passion and pursuing the things of God. And then we go to chapter 2. And in chapter 2, he begins to orchestrate. He takes an honest evaluation. How bad is it? And finally, 52 days later, he finishes the wall. They had to endure internal fighting. Sounds familiar? They had to endure fighting amongst themselves. And they had to endure the enemy using mind tactics and mind, mind games. And then they had to endure fighting amongst themselves. And then the enemy is trying to strike back. But Nehemiah stayed faithful. But here's the power of all that God wants us to do. This blew my mind. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, Nehemiah prayed for four months before anything happened, but it took less than two months for him to complete the wall. The spiritual battle is always greater than the physical one. The reason why many of us don't complete what God calls us to do is because we do not put any weight on the spiritual things. He prayed for four months. He saw a problem, and then he prayed and fasted before he did anything. We see a problem, and we jump right into it, not even asking God what he wants. One of my greatest, one of, in my mind, the greatest in my lifetime, the greatest boxer is Iron Mike Tyson, but before the whole tattoo face thing. This is his physical regimen when he was in his heyday, between 21 and 24. Eight to 10 hours a day of physical training for six days a week. He would study his craft. Mmm, good one. Uh, he would study his craft between two hours a day, 
watching film, enhancing techniques. He woke up at four o'clock in the morning and jogged three to five miles. Rain, sleet, snow. Every day. Then he would have breakfast. And then he would spar the 10 to 12 rounds every day. So he did multiple sets of calisthenics. 2,000 sit-ups, 500 push-ups, 500 dips, 500 shrugs, and 30 minutes, minutes of neck bridges, whatever that is. Uh, conditioning was experienced in the ring, I mean outside of the ring, because of what happens in the ring. One of the things that he says, discipline is doing what you hate to do, but nonetheless doing it like you love it. So, but here's the spiritual lesson for all of us. He did all of that six days a week, diet, exercise, putting his body through that regiment for a 36-minute fight. What we have a tendency to do is train like we are not in a fight. When he was at his heyday, he couldn't take any days off. But if we look at the from the spiritual standpoint, why we keep taking days off? The enemy, I, was, I think I was talking to Tiffany about this. The enemy is relentless against us. Yet, we don't even hold truth, hold to the truth of God's word because we don't know it. So we have reduced God's word to cliches. And so we just say it, don't even embrace it, don't know it, don't study it, and wonder why every time something happens, woe is me, and I feel like I'm in the plane of, oh, no. Because what happens is the regimen, the exercise, Mike Tyson, the, the moment that he took time off was the moment that he took his opponent, Buster Douglas, for granted. And that is what he's known for, getting knocked out by a guy who didn't stand a chance. Because the very thing that he conditioned himself to do, he stopped. Conditioning, stamina, resilience, power, strength is built through prayer. And for some of us, that's the first thing that goes. You pick up the phone, you call everybody. And you even, dis and you gotta be careful because I, I had to check my heart, man, because I do that too sometimes. Sometimes I'm really complaining as disguised as a prayer request. Yep, me. Sometimes the truth of the matter is that we reject what we know to be truth because we want to wallow in our self-pity. Prayer, the conditioning, the resilience, that is the actual thing that prepares us when the enemy strikes. But because some of us are so like this, the enemy is not striking us. He just turned ourselves over to our own minds. Wash me, Jesus, in your precious blood. Verse number 16, when all the enemies heard of it and all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of God. They finally got it. They finally, the enemies finally realized that they weren't fighting against Nehemiah. They were fighting against God. And their breath was taken from them. And so, there were many friends of the enemy as revealed by, chapter, by verse number 17 and 19. So while you were doing the work, you did not know. Moreover, in those days of the nobles of Judah was sent many letters to, Dubai, to Tobiah. And Tobiah's letters came to them. Ah, oh, man, it's hurt for here. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and his son. Jehohanan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berias, and his wife. Also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. So what they begin to realize is 
while they were going through all of these things, the people they thought was for them was actually with his enemies. But God in his sovereign, his sovereignty protected that from him. So he can focus on the work. So sometimes what God will reveal to all of us is after you finish, he reveals your true friends. Because it's not over. This season, you're building your marriage. But next season, you might have to build your finances. You might have to build your health. You might have to build your faith. So if we're going to win a war against the enemy, we can take a look at what Nehemiah did. And then we can park with the book of James, chapter 4. First thing we have to do, and if you hear, this is the pinnacle. This is the, the big part. First thing we have to do is to submit to God. Y'all got to hear me. I'm not saying submit to me. I'm saying submit to God for yourself. Jeremiah, James, the book of James, chapter 7. You got to get this. Some of us are running from thing to thing, wanting some, wanting some formula or steps, uh, wanting to be validated. And so for a season, the enemy leaves, then he comes back. And sometimes he'll find you and I in the worst scenario, the worst situation, because sometimes you're most vulnerable after victory because while you're celebrating, he's plotting. And so uh, oftentimes what happens to us all is we have a move of God and we'll hunger for that experience again, so we try to duplicate it. And that is the very thing that becomes an idol because God can come in like a flood. He can come in like a twinkle. But the key is not the feeling about him. It's about him. And so some of us are using church and groups and all those things, and they have his place. But that doesn't mean you're submitted to God. It just means you're committed. But committed and submitted are two different things. See, we're about to baptize someone, and, and what, what that simply means is, Lord, you have authority over me. That's what submission is. I know we know him as Savior, but do you know him as Lord? Because the very thing that I want to do, Missy, I don't do, because I'm submitted to God. I want to give, I want to respond, but can't, because I'm submitted to God surrendering to him so James chapter 4 verse number 7 it's a beautiful reminder to us all in the spirit of what Nehemiah is doing so submit yourselves therefore to God and then the second part of that is resist the devil I submit to God y'all hear me I submit to God and then I resist the devil, and there's a promise associated with it, and he will flee from you. I resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So if I want to stand against the devil's deception, I must resist. Because the enemy will return again and tempt you again, but I must keep resisting and I get my strength from submitting to God do you see the connection that I submit to God I resist the devil and so how do I continually submit to God I continually submit to God by honoring him as Lord but I can't know him in the fullness without his word let's not gather just to eat Let's feast at the table of his word. So he says, submit 
yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he will flee and then he says draw near to God and this is the promise and he will draw near to you